Hi everyone, Brian here, wishing you a wonderful Monday and a great week ahead. We're looking at the book of Proverbs right now, uh, which, you know, before I really thought to look at the Bible for insight about soulfulness and how the human soul works, I saw as a book of, you know, quick, uh, down and dirty, practical ways to live your life uh, as nobly, decently, and morally as possible. Uh, but uh, we've been looking at the Bible as a source of wisdom and insight about how human beings can be in touch with their deep selves um, uh, alongside, not over against, but alongside their everyday selves. I always point to my head for the ed everyday self because that's where we think of all our busyness going on and uh, to, toward the heart for the deep self. Of course, uh, all of our cognitive capacities are happening up in, in the head, uh, but we do feel them as two separate things. Uh, and um, in our very busy, very complex, in some ways very demanding uh, postmodern world, there is a lot to command us. Uh, I'm always struck, now that I'm a grandfather, at uh, how much my grandchildren are learning in elementary school uh, that uh, I didn't learn until high school, and in some instances didn't even know about until college. Um, so the, the expansion, especially in the world of math and science, uh, and the expectations that each new generation will be much more insightful, much more well-educated, uh, about some of these things and more integrated into the everyday use of them uh, becomes more and more real. Not to mention the fact that life uh, is uh, challenging and complex, uh, especially in a uh, you know, non-traditional world. And we've been working at breaking away from traditional roles and ways of being for a very long time now. And Perhaps we're still in that process, though I like to think we're also finding the value in some of those earlier traditions uh, that we were so eager to get away from. Of course, there's been a lot of good stuff there. What I'm saying is that the everyday um, uh, self is, especially in our world, very busy all the time. And uh, we have much less time for relaxing and reflection and even for those people who go to church, we are still not in an environment that invites us to comprehend the uh, gentle insight that comes from meditation, from quiet life, from uh, integrating, say, uh, doing the Psalms with everyday life. Uh, we're far away from that. We're far away from conversations about what a mystic might uh, understand and be able to add to an experience of the world. We're just very far away from all of these things. Uh, and so, uh, as I've been saying, we tend to see scripture as fulfilling two purposes. First, uh, to be uh, at least the only documents or the primary documents we have uh, for understanding the history of the people of faith, beginning with Abraham and Moses and the prophets and all the stories about uh, the nations of Israel and Judah uh, and then in the uh, sort of Christian addendum to all of that which we call the New Testament the life of Jesus and the early church uh, and some of their thinking about uh, how to live out that um, Hebrew promise uh, Secondly, we tend to think of it as a source of theological and moral insight, that it's a how-to book uh, for living in a world where we have faith in uh, a God uh, as the creator and savior of all of creation. Um, and, you know, who that God is, what the nature of God is like, and, of course, how we ought to respond to that God. Uh, and those two things are absolutely there. It's not the purpose of this series to debunk it or demean it or belittle it at all. 
only to say that there is this third way of comprehending scripture, which is to say it's the story uh, told over many generations and in very many different circumstances what the life of the soul is like. So that it's a study uh, of how we can live more fully into our own soulfulness. So I'm just going to read the first um, eight verses of the third chapter of Proverbs. My child, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and abundant welfare they will give you. Do not let loyalty and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and of people. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not rely on your own insight. In all your ways, acknowledge him, meaning God, and he will make straight your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be a healing for your flesh and a refreshment for your body. So uh, I want to just underscore a couple of points for us to think about. Um, I was fascinated when uh, Roger and I took our, uh, at that time still very new dog, uh, to a trainer so that he could um, perhaps live a little less rambunctiously and we might have some hope of living a balanced life in our house with this new member. Uh, she pointed out to us that human beings assess uh, each other beginning with the outside and then in time going within. In other words, we want to see how people look. We, uh, we, can, we make a lot of judgments on especially our first impressions of people. Uh, and then we listen for what they say, we watch what they do, and bit by bit, over time, we begin to trust that these external indicators will give us a sense of who the interior person is. But she said dogs work in a very different way. Uh, they are all about sensing the interior person and paying much less attention to the external um, look, how you look, or even what you do or say. This is very important, obviously, if you think the important thing of dealing with a dog is uh, what you're doing and especially what you're saying to it. Uh, and the dog is not responding and it's, it's uh, a very important insight to have. Uh, what she was telling us is that the dog senses, first and foremost, uh, kind of where you are at. Uh, not just, uh, you know, sort of emotionally, but also kind of in the fullness of your being. So, you know, her first recommendation for dealing with a dog is to take a deep breath, calm down yourself, uh, not let the dog, no matter what its behavior is, get you wrangled, and in a very calm and peaceful way uh, make your um, uh, need for the dog to behave in a certain way clear to the dog. Well, I'm mentioning that because, of course, that is at the heart of almost every religion around the world. Um, we've gotten so activated in the modern world with everything we can do on the external sides of who we are, uh, that, um, uh, that we've sort of completely privatized the interior life, and in some cases we even try to keep it as a secret. But for millennia, religions have tried to get people to connect their outer and their inner world. And the inner world is the realm of this deeper self or the place the soul dwells within. So I'm struck over and over and over again that uh, the book of Proverbs, the author of Proverbs, is directing us to get out of our heads and into our hearts. Uh, and that this is where God is to be found, this is where wisdom is to be found, this is where peace is to be found. 
Uh, it it uh, strikes me here, I mean, again, thinking of our story, my story with our dog Dobby, uh, let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and abundant welfare they will give you. Uh, so once again, the whole point of Proverbs is not to wrangle you into uh, a different behavior, but to encourage you to look inside quietly become at peace with yourself, uh, expect and accept the wisdom uh, that is freely given to you there. Uh, the second thing uh, that I want to point out is that the book of Proverbs uh, presupposes that in this interior you will find God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on all your insight. Uh, so uh, the book of Proverbs, again, not, you can't uh, just figure this out. Uh, you can think, oh, that's rational. That's a rational way to be. That's a reasonable point. Um, and, and those are good things, by the way. I'm not, again, we're not criticizing that. But the book of Proverbs is always saying, but let God bubble up from within you. And, and this is to acknowledge that God is there. So it tells us a point about the soul. Uh, and it's one that's really worth understanding all the time. I remember back in the 1980s when the abbot at uh, Three Rivers, Benedict Reed, used to tell us who were novices that um, everyone is a mystic. Well, I knew I wasn't a mystic, so how could everyone be a mystic? Didn't know any mystics in my life at all. Uh, but I finally figured out what he was saying. Um, yes, not everybody is going to be categorized as a mystic, uh, just like not everyone is going to be uh, categorized as a great athlete or categorized as a musician. But that doesn't mean, if you're not an athlete, it doesn't mean you can't get out there on Thanksgiving morning and toss a football around uh, in a, a flag football match. Or uh, not being classified a musician doesn't mean you can't gather around a piano where there is a musician and uh, sing um, show tunes uh, as a fun way to spend an evening. Uh, uh, we all have these, all of these capacities. Um, I'm never going to be a physicist, but I actually enjoy reading about modern physics. Um, hard for my brain to hold on to it, but um, I, I at least can comprehend what they're saying, at least for a moment. The same is true of mysticisms. There are people who are mystics. Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, uh, among the most famous. Um, uh, we know in our tradition, in Anglicanism in particular, we, we look to Julian of Norwich. Uh, but uh, even if we're not going to be categorized as a mystic, we all have the capacity to be moved from the inside out. Uh, and this happens whenever, uh, say for example, we see the first signs of spring. We're moved on the inside. When we realize we've fallen in love, we're moved from the inside out. Uh, there are lots of times, probably every single day, when we are stirred from within. Now, modern biological, psychiatric, uh, purely secular uh, uh, folk would say that that's simply uh, a function of our uh, the lobes of our brains that uh, developed when we were evolving as a species in order to keep us together, give us a sense of awe that would help us form community, which was the only way we could survive as a species. Um, and that's certainly one theory. My theory is that these awesome experiences are just as authentic as experiences of putting your toe in the water to see if it's going to be too cold uh, to dive into, uh, you know, the first time you're in Lake Michigan uh, in the swimming season. Um, we can trust that these things are real. A lot of them are in the realm 
of reality. Um, seeing a beautiful sunset, uh, 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 a brand new baby, a uh, rainbow, uh, listening to uh, music of any genre that really uh, sparks uh, some feeling for you. Uh, being awed by architecture or any other art form, really. Um, feeling like at the end of a play you just have to stand up and applaud because it's been so marvelous. Uh, it can also be other things. It can be things that are horrifying or terrifying or upsetting or hurtful. Uh, these are all things that uh, tell us the reality of the soul at work within us. But the book of Proverbs trusts that the soul does not stop there. There's this half of it that's very interested in giving vibrancy and meaning and joy and zest to the experiences in this concrete world we share with others. But it also, the same soul and doing the same thing is open to a kind of rhythmic flow of the divine uh, that uh, is inaugurated outside of time and space and is in no way dependent on energy or matter uh, to uh, touch us. Uh, this becomes even more difficult in the in a sort of modern scientific worldview because this really can't be tacked down, it can't be studied, it can't be put under a microscope. Uh, and so we've tended to believe it therefore doesn't exist. But the author of Proverbs believes it does exist and that at this level where we already have a sense of zest, hope, joy, uh, um, uh, liveliness, significance of life in things that we can easily relate to and talk to about others, we have that same zest, hope, uh, contact with a divine rhythm uh, that uh, comes from God in heaven and we experience it here. So I just want to leave us with those two thoughts today that are coming out of the book of Proverbs. That wisdom is found within, this, this, and the, the way to live is found within by listening to the deep self, the place where the soul exists. And that within that, to listen to not only the concrete reality of life that we live day by day, but to be equally open to the rhythm of the divine that is also there. Uh, so let's uh, see how the book of Proverbs takes us from there. Uh, but there's a chunk for you to uh, think about, pray about, and maybe even get in touch with that heart about this week. Thanks for listening. Have a great week. I'll see you next Monday.